Grace and peace be unto you in the name of God, my Father, my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and as always, the indwelling, powerful presence of Holy Spirit, who is God. I bless you and I thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Elijah of Sound Doctrine Deliverance Ministries in Emporia, Virginia, and I greet you in the name of Jesus. Um, as you can tell again from the background, you know where we are. <laughs> Praise God. We're back down and, uh, with my parents and my brothers and sisters, and we are praising God for this evening. Um, Apostle is not with us right now, but he's on the way. So during the course of the study, when you hear the door open and some laughing and giggling and all that, you know he's here. But right now, uh, Mom is here. She's at the end of the table, and my brothers Maurice and, and, and Country is here, and my Sister Gwen is here, and this other lady, <coughs> um, I, I, I can never remember her name. I think it's Prophetess Sarah, something like that. Your wife. She's here. And so we praise God. And um, we're going to do some things a little different this evening. But first and foremost, because we came on a half hour later than normal, we usually come on at 6.30, but life happens, and you have to adjust with what goes on. We thank God for 7 o'clock that comes after 6.30. But I'm going to give everybody a few more minutes in case you're taking care of the children or changing the pamper or storing your macaroni and cheese on the stove or whatever you're doing and you want to get you some note paper and all that stuff. It's not going to be a long lesson tonight, but it's, it's a necessary lesson because as we know, God has been dealing with us with the things that we say. He has been dealing with us with the words that come out of our mouth. And this lesson tonight is the culmination of all of that to the glory of God. And I'm excited about it. Um, it's going to tear down one of the myths that we've always heard in church about some things that God will or won't do. Well, his word is his word. And what it says he does, he did. So it's, it's nothing we can say to it. So we bless God for that. Um, but first and foremost, as always, let's go before the throne of grace and have a word of prayer. <clears throat> Eternal God, our Father, we bless you and we thank you, Lord, for this day. Yes, Lord. We thank you for keeping us throughout the course of this day from hurt, harm, and danger. We yes. thank you, Father, because at this hour during the day, we still have this precious gift that we call life. Yes. We may have a few aches and pains. We may have looked in the mirror and noticed a few more gray hair. We may have yes, noticed God. the hairline retreating, but Father, we are still here. Jesus and as long Christ. as we're here, we have an opportunity to bless and praise your name. Mm -hmm. We have an opportunity to correct some of our wrongs. We have an opportunity to tell somebody about the goodness of Jesus yes. and let them know, oh God, that not only do you love them, but we love them also. And Father, we bless you and we thank you. It's not something that we take lightly because you have entrusted us to represent yes. you right here on this earth. So, Father, we just want to honor you this evening in Jesus' name, Lord. We ask, Father, if there's any sins or iniquities in our lives that you would grant us forgiveness in the name of Jesus. Yes, Blot out yes. our sins and transgressions, O oh God, and remember yes, them no more. Yes, we ask, Holy Spirit, that you would breathe on us afresh because yes, it's declared in your word that where two or three are gathered together in your name, yes, you are right there in the midst. Yes, so, Father, we praise you for being here with us this evening. Yes, we ask, oh God, that you give grace to all that you would touch to be a part of this study in the name of Jesus, yes, that we would all learn, that we would all get a better understanding yes, and grow just a little bit closer to you. Yes, and now, Father, I ask that you anoint me again with that anointing that makes teaching and declaring your word easy, oh God. Yes. So that we can all, Father God, continue to walk in the path of righteousness for your name's sake. In Jesus' name, in Jesus name. Amen. 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 So, brothers and sisters, as I said, we're going to do something a little different this evening before we get started with this lesson. Because you always hear about me talking about my family and, and the things that we do together, the things, how, how, how life goes. You need to understand that we are a family unit and we are a team when it comes to ministry and things in life. And so I always call out names, but you never hear them say anything and you certainly never see them. So my brother Maurice is right here beside me. So you're going to see me step out of the camera and he's going to come before you in just a few minutes and introduce himself and just say a few words to the glory of God. Amen. So here comes Brother Maurice. Oh, mercy. Mm. Oh, he did. Are you ready? Jesus. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Watch the cord when you step over. 
Wow. Well, God bless everyone. Um, or Maurice. Um, wow. I just want to say um, my biggest hope for everybody is to everybody is, um, to accept Christ. Uh, that's the biggest um, my biggest advice I can give to, to give everyone. If you haven't, uh, if you haven't accepted Christ, please do so. Amen. 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 And now, because of the space we're in, I'm gonna have to do a little moving. You just bear with me. We're gonna get to the lesson, but we also have my sister Gwen down here, and she's going to wow. greet you in the name of Jesus, and she has a few words for you as well. Here she is. God bless you, everyone. My name is Gwendolyn Baker. It's truly an honor to greet you. May God continue to bless you richly. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. My mama's here, and she's running, so we're going to have to come back and catch her, but my brother, country, is here, and he got a few words for you. Oh, God bless you, everyone that's out there and that's listening. May the grace of God be upon you. We thank God for Jesus Christ. And Rome, don't forget what Romans 5 says. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God Amen. through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, Amen. by whom we have access. So remember, you got access unto God for whatever you want, you can ask for. Thank you, Prophet Elijah, for allowing me to stand. Yes, sir. All right, sir. Yes, sir. God bless you. Um, obviously, Mama not coming back down here. And y'all know her, but she gonna say something anyway. Really? Is it there? Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm not gonna take up time. I'm gonna pass this back on to him. How y'all doing? Hi, Mom. Say hi. Hi, babies. So, praise God. That's the team that we're down here. This is the family. This is the core, the heart and soul of the ministry. And now we see, hey, Isha, hey, prophetess. I love you, I love you, I love you. Sister Elaine, God bless you. So, here we go. The lesson, as I said tonight, is, 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 is almost, I would say, the conclusion, but not the conclusion, of what God has been dealing with us with over the last few weeks. Everything that we've dealt with thus far has something to do with the words we speak. Uh, that come out of our mouth, and and are they scripture? And is some of the things that we have been taught over the years is it doctrine or is it man made? Is it denominational? And God has been tearing down some untruths we have been told our whole life, and we're about to tear down another one, but we're going to tear it down with the expectation that you will realize just how powerful your words are. We know that God made everything. But the question is, did God really make everything? When we say that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the same was the meaning with God, and all things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made, we look at Christ, we look at God as the creator of everything. But I'm going to tell you one thing that's in existence that God did not make. And you're scratching your head. Mm -hmm. And you're probably trying to figure out what it is. Mm -hmm. There is something in existence that most people use every day. All of us have used at least once in our life that God did not make. God never made excuses. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> we make excuses about things almost every day. At some point in our life, to justify our behavior, we made an excuse. God never made excuses. I need you to think about that. The words that we say, Scripture tells us, and I have shared with you over and over again, by our words, we shall be justified. And by our words, we shall be condemned. And that has a double-edged meaning. First and foremost, the words is when you are either accepting or rejecting Christ. When you accept Christ, your words will justify you. 
When you reject Christ, your words will condemn you. That's the first and most important meaning. But the passage also lets us know that we have to give account for every idle word that comes out of our mouth. Everything. For my Bible students, for my young ones in ministry, when you search the scripture, you'll find out God don't even make an excuse for when people are joking. When you say something, you say, I'm just joking. The word calls it foolish justing, J-E-S-T-I-N-G. We as children of God are not even supposed to do that because even in a joking manner, your words still have life. Your words still have meaning and you still have to give account. Does that mean God is like some, some tyrant that's sitting on his throne with a yardstick and his glasses on the end of his nose, just looking and dissecting everything you say? No, it means God is holding you accountable for what comes out your mouth. Simple as that. You can say what you want to say, but you're going to give an account one way or the other. The Bible also talks to us about vows. Mm -hmm. I have taught you before, and I'll say it again for the sake of this lesson. The biggest lies ever told by man is generally told in the church. And I'll get even more specific. When men and women stand with a minister and say their marriage vows, those are the biggest lies usually told in the church in the name of Jesus. Because they stand before man and before God and they vow all of this love and all these promises to each other on Monday. And when you go talk to that same couple six months from now, they done cussed each other out. They hate each other. They want a divorce. They wish they would have never did this. But what happened to the vows you spoke before God? What happened to the commitments that you made to love and to honor and to cherish and to build up and to upkeep? That went straight out the window as soon as you got mad. But they're your words. They're the things that you say. So what does God say about vows? What does God say about the things that come out of your mouth? We've already been over the lesson that death and life is in the power of the tongue. The Bible tells us to study to be quiet. Okay. How many people strive to keep their mouth shut? How many people try to use... I asked a question before, and they even made a movie. I think Eddie Murphy may have made the movie. I'm not sure. But if the day you were born, God said, for the duration of your life, you only have 50,000 words. How many of us would have already been silenced and how long ago? Because there are some people, and we all know somebody, there are some people who don't know how to be quiet to say their life. They talk and they sleep. There are some people who, if they're not talking, they're miserable. They don't know how to just be quiet. Just learn how to listen and how to hear. They always got to talk. And these people need to understand that everything you're talking about, you have to give an account for. The word is the word. Every idle word. When you get mad, Isha, and you cuss people out, you have to give an account of your words. <laughs> you have to give an account of your words. Every idle word we have to give account of. So the word, the Bible tells us to let our words be few. And what, what God wants from us is a gentle and meek spirit. He wants us to be the type of people that have enough respect. It's an old saying. God gave us two eyes, two ears, and one mouth. Because we're supposed to watch and listen twice as much as we speak. But how many of us do this? Now, you're asking, what am I building up to? What am I building up to? Well, I'm going to tell you what I'm building up to. We're going to read a couple passages. Then I'm going to show you something. And I want you to let sink in what I'm about to show you. Let's turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Ecclesiastes chapter 5. For those of you who don't know where Ecclesiastes is, Go to Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Ecclesiastes. You know <laughs> I'm gonna need you to do Chapter that. 5. Old Testament. <laughs> and I need you to understand the significance of what we're about to understand, what we're about to receive. Amen. Hey, Sister Elaine. Sister Sherman. <laughs> God bless you, sis. Ecclesiastes chapter 5. 
It comes right after Proverbs. It's also it's also considered a book of wisdom because uh, Solomon, mm -hmm. who is king, penned the majority of this book. But listen to what we, we're going to start at verse one, and I'm reading from my King James version. Whatever version you have, we're going to get there together. I also want to send a greeting out in case he is watching to my to my brother, Prophet Rawls, Prophet Jamie Rawls. God bless you, brother. Keep on doing what you're doing. God got you, and I'm with you. The word of God says, keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God, and be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools, for they consider not that they do evil. Did you hear that part? We ain't even got into the good yet. But it says, be more ready to hear than to get a sacrifice of fools. I'm going to let y'all study and figure out what the sacrifice of fools is. Now listen. Be not rash with thy mouth. And let not thine heart be hasty to other anything before God. For God is in heaven and thou upon earth. Therefore, let thy words be few. For a dream cometh through the multitude of business, and a fool's voice is known by multitude of words. We're going to pause right there. Because I want you to allow what's being said to you to sink in. A whole lot of talking leads to sin, and it leads to foolishness. A whole lot of rash talking leads to trouble. And rash, reckless. You you don't you don't think things through. The first thing that come to your mind, you say it. That's rash. It's reckless. We're supposed to be able to govern ourselves. We're supposed to be able to contain our emotions. We're supposed to be able to verbalize the words that we say in the name of Jesus to where God is glorified through our speech. If you really want to know how somebody feel about you, listen to them when they're talking to you. Listen to them when they're telling jokes. Listen to them when they're drunk. Mm. And a lot of my brothers and sisters still get drunk. Listen to them. They're going to tell you exactly how they feel about you. Listen to them when things aren't going their way. What comes out of their mouth? The words that come out of our mouths are embedded somewhere in our heart. That's scripture. So even when we say, oh, I didn't really mean to say that to you. I didn't mean to call you that. Yes, you did. And it's in your heart somewhere. That's why it came out your mouth. Nothing comes out of you unless it's in you. That's word. That's scripture. It ain't mine. It's God's. God never said anything to us he didn't mean. And as children of God, as men and women of God, we're never supposed to say anything that we don't mean. And I told you before, and I'll say it again. Words spoken can never be unspoken. Once you say something to somebody, they're always going to know and remember you said it. Even though you apologize a thousand times, it don't take the word away. It don't take the sting of the word away. And the problem, brothers and sisters, with some people is, it's not so much what's being said that hurts them. It's the person that's saying it. That's what hurt them. Because when we have people that we love, when we have brothers and sisters in our lives, we don't expect certain things to ever come out of their mouth, even when we're upset. And when they do, we remember it. I told you before, because it's me. I always use me. I only throw other people under the bus when I know they're mature enough to handle it. A lot of people aren't, even though they say they are. But I use me. My mouth is vicious, especially when I was in the street. I would say some things to you that will have you questioning who God is and who your parents is, even though you was in the house with your parents every day. When I got finished saying what I was saying, my tongue was that vicious. I'm going to make you wonder about some things. I said some things to prophetess over the years that should have never come out of my mouth. Amen. Even though she says she forgave me, the bottom line is I should have never said them. And that's what God requires from us. You have to take accountability and responsibility for the words that have come out of your mouth, no matter when they came out. And if you have not made that thing right, you need to make it right. Because God holds us accountable. Isha, I know you have some people you need to apologize to and make some things right because you're my daughter. So I know your tongue is sharp. Amen. Amen. Or it used to be. But now we have to be slow to speak. So, and that's what you should say. 
So now <laughs> let's go to verse four. And this is what I need you to pay attention to. When thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay it. For he has no pleasure in fools. Pay that which thou hast vowed. Better it is that thou shouldest not vow than that thou shouldest vow and not pay. Suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin. Now look at the, look at the next part. Neither say thou before the angel that it was an error. Wherefore should God be angry at thy voice and destroy the work of thy hands? For in a multitude of dreams, in many words, there are also diverse vanities, but fear thou God. Let me break it down. When you vow unto God, you cannot come back and say, Lord, you know I was in a bad situation. You know I, you know I didn't really mean it. I, God ain't trying to hear that. God takes vows extremely seriously. What is a vow? A promise. When you make a promise to God, you better keep it. Because he's going to hold you to that promise. Now, before I tell you this next part, I want you all to take a few minutes and think about different situations that unfolded in your life where you promised God, if he got you out of it, you would do this, you would do that, you would do the other, and you still haven't done it. I want you to think about it. Because most people I know, especially myself, we have all found ourselves in a situation where we made a promise to God. Lord, oh my God, if you just get me out of this, Father, I'm going to church and I'm going to behave and I'm going to stop wearing mini skirts and I'm going to stop drinking and I'm going to stop. And when God got you out of it, you found a reason to go back on your promise. Jesus. You said, Lord, you know I didn't really mean it. You know I was just in a bad emotional state. You know I was, God ain't trying to hear none of that. And here's the lie I told you that's going to be destroyed. A lot of ministers will tell you, don't even worry about that because God don't make deals with people like that. God is not a deal maker. Newsflash. The word of God is the word of God. And I'm going to show you two different instances in the word of God. When somebody said, Lord, if you, if you, if you, and God did it. So if God ain't a deal maker, mm -hmm. they need to explain what we're about to go to right now in the word of God. Go to Genesis chapter 28. Genesis chapter 28. And before we get to where we're going to, I'm just going to give you some context while you're, while you're reading. Abraham had Isaac. Isaac had Jacob. Abraham, of course, we know God told him to leave his family and leave his land. And he was going to make him a father of many nations. And he came across and he did some things. And he was the first Hebrew. When you see the term Hebrews in scripture, Abraham was the first Hebrew. In context, the word Hebrew means he who crossed over. When Abraham left his home and crossed through the land and crossed over the water, he became the first Hebrew, according to scripture. Abraham had a son of the promise, which was Isaac. Isaac had a son named Jacob. Now, before Jacob became who he was, he knew of the God his father served. He knew of the things that they had been through. And now God is about to start dealing with Jacob. And that's where we get the story of Jacob's ladder. When he had a dream and he seen a ladder going from heaven to earth, touching the earth and angels going up and down. And God started talking to Jacob and revealing some things to Jacob. And as we get all the way to matter of fact, I'm going to show you what God said. Let's go to chapter 28 and I'm going to start at verse 10. Chapter 28 of Genesis, verse 10. And Jacob went out from Beersheba. And went toward Haran. And he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set. And he took of the stones of that place and put them for his pillows and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed 
And behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascended and descended on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the God of Abraham thy father and the God of Isaac. The land whereupon thou liest, to thee will I give it into thy seed. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. God is talking to Jacob. And behold, I am with thee and will keep thee in all places whither thou goest and will bring thee again into this land. For I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken of to thee. And Jacob waked out of his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. And he was afraid and said, How dreadful is this place. This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. And Jacob rose up early in the morning and took the stones that he had put for his pillows and set it up for a pillar and poured oil upon the top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel. Because that was the name of the city that was called Luz at first. Now listen to the next verses. And Jacob vowed a vow saying, if, stop right there. <laughs> I-F is the biggest word in the English language. Yeah. I-F means there is a choice. Yeah. If, and let me tell you a little secret. In every language... Around the world, if is one of the few words that have the same meaning. It denotes a choice. If. If you do this, this. If you do this, this. Jesus said, if you abide in me. He gave you a choice. Now let's get back to this. And Jacob vowed a vow saying, if God be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat, and raiment to put on, so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God. And this stone, which I have set up for a pillar, shall be God's house, and of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tenth to thee. God gave Jacob a dream and told Jacob what he was going to do. Jacob said, if you allow me to do this and to do that and then to come back safely, then you will be my God. Did you ever see that in scripture before? Jacob didn't immediately say after the dream, I receive and I accept. No, no, no. Jacob had some conditions. Let's go back and read it again in case your Bible ain't got that verse in there. Chapter 28, verse 20 said, and Jacob vowed a vow. Jacob made a promise. Jacob said, if, God will be with me and keep me the way that I go and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on so that I come again to my father's house in peace. Then shall the Lord be my God. Jacob made a, a, a deal with God. He put out a bargain on the table. Mm -hmm. You told me what you were going to do. You will be my God. If you allow me to do this and do that and then bring me home safely, then you will be my God. But they tell you God ain't never did anything like that before. Hmm. That's why I tell you, brothers and sisters, and I will say it again. I tell Isha and I will say it again. I tell everyone that ever been in my homiletics class. I don't care who's telling you what and who they claim to be. Go to the word of God. What does the word of God say? Yep. Forget what man say. Show it to you in the book. But that might not be enough for you. Mm. This next one, I promise, is going to blow your mind. Go to Judges chapter 11. Judges chapter 11. The judges is a time where there wasn't a king. It wasn't a king. So God would raise different people up to lead his people. When we get to Judges chapter 11, Israel is going through some if ands about who's going to lead them and who's going to do what, etc., etc., so on and so on. But now watch this. I'm going to start reading. It's a lot of reading, but it has to be read 
for the context of the lesson. I'm not going to read all of 11, but I want you to get just the beginning. Now, Jephthah, the Galeadite, was a mighty man of valor, and he was the son of a harlot. And Galeed, and Galeed begat Jephthah. And Galeed's wife bare him sons, and his wife's sons grew up, and they thrust out Jephthah. And said unto him, Thou shalt not inherit in our father's house, for thou art the son of a strange woman. And Jephthah fled from his brethren and dwelt in the land of Tob. And there were gathered vain men to Jephthah and went out with him. His family kicked him out because they had the same father, different mother. Same thing a lot of us did growing up. Mm -hmm. You ain't my real brother. You my stepbrother. Your mama ain't my mama. Same, same. That's what they did. Mm -hmm. So he went out. And he got some more people that were rejected, and they formed their own little army. <laughs> now, let's get to the meat and potatoes. Let's go all the way over to verse 29. This is where we're going to get to the meat and potatoes. Because some war is coming to Israel, mm -hmm. and they need somebody that's willing to lead them. They need somebody that's not afraid and know how to use that sword. Mm -hmm. in, verse, in verse 29. Then the spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah, and he passed over Gilead and Manasseh and passed over Mispaz of Gilead, and went from Mispaz of Gilead, he passed over unto the children of Ammon. And Jephthah vowed a vow unto the Lord. Wait a minute, hold up. I need y'all to hear this vow, and I need you to understand the importance of the words that come out of your mouth when you make promises to God. And Jephthah vowed a vow unto the Lord and said, If, your Bible should have an if in it. Yes, it does. If thou shalt without fail deliver the children of Ammon into my hands, mm -hmm. then it shall be that whatsoever cometh forth of my doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the children of Ammon shall surely be the Lord's and I will offer it up for a burnt offering. Mm -hmm. I'm going to read that again. Because I don't think you understand what we're talking about right now. <clears throat> and Jephthah vowed a vow unto the Lord and said, If thou shalt without fail deliver the children of Ammon into my hands, then it shall be that whatsoever cometh forth of the doors of my house to meet me when mm -hmm. I return in peace from the children of Ammon shall surely be the Lord's, and I will offer it up for a burnt Jesus. offering. Now watch this. So Jephthah passed over unto the children of Ammon to fight against them, and the Lord delivered them unto his hands. Mm. And he smote them from Aor, even till thou cometh to Mineth, even twenty cities, and unto the plain of the vineyards, with a very great slaughter, thus the children of Ammon were subdued before the children of Israel. Watch this. And Jephthah came to Mespah unto his house, and behold, his daughter came out to meet him with timbrels and with dance, and she was his only child. Beside her he had neither son nor daughter. And it came to pass when he saw her that he rent his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, thou hast bought me very low, and thou art one of them that trouble me. For I have opened my mouth to the Lord, and I cannot go back. Jesus. And she said unto him, My father, if thou hast opened thy mouth to the Lord, do to me according to that which has proceeded out of thy mouth. For as much as the Lord has taken vengeance for thee of thy enemies, even of the children of Ammon. And she said unto her father, let this thing be done for me. Let me alone two months that I may go up and down upon the mountains and bewail my virginity, I and my fellows. And he said, go. And he sent her away for two months. And she went with her companions and bewailed her virginity upon the mountains. And it came to pass at the end of two months that she returned unto her father who did with her according to his vow, which he had vowed, and she knew no man, and it was a custom in Israel that the daughters of Israel went yearly to lament the daughter of Jephthah for the Galilite four days in a year. Hmm. This man hmm. promised God, 
if you give me victory in war over my enemies, mm -hmm. the first thing that come out of my house, I'm going to sacrifice to you for a burnt offering. Mm -hmm. God gave him victory. The first thing that came out was his daughter. My God. Mm -hmm. Now, let me tell you how the people oh, wow. who don't rightly divide the word of God and can't deal with the context of this passage, yeah. let me tell you what they say. They say the offering that she gave was to go up in the mountains and never have a husband and always be a virgin. Oh, That's what they'll tell you. The word of God said, he said, I will offer up to you a burnt, burnt offering. offering. Mm -hmm. You do your research and mm -hmm. find out what a burnt offering mm -hmm. is. Now, here's the second thing they're going to say. God don't accept human sacrifice. Uh -huh. So God would never allow him or tell him to do that. Here's how you keep scripture in context. Mm -hmm. God didn't tell him to do it. He did. My God. God never told anybody to offer up their child as a human sacrifice. Mm -hmm. God said, when you vow a vow unto me, keep your vow. My God, God said, don't be rash. Don't be quick with the words that come out of your mouth mm -hmm. because I'm going to hold you accountable to your vows. Yeah. So, the, and, and also remember this, during the time of this, during the time that was going on in this, they didn't have the type of relationship with God the way that we do. Mm. They understood God's the way they understood God's coming from whatever land they came from. And human sacrifice was part of what they believed. Mm. So he figured anything that I offer up as a burnt offering would be pleasing to God. He had no idea his daughter, his only child was wow. going to come out of that door. Mm. But he made a vow and God kept his end of the deal. God gave them victory over their enemies. So if God made his end of the deal, you have to honor yours. He offered up his daughter as a burnt offering. Wow. Not because offering children was a part of God's worship. No, mm -hmm. but it's because you opened your mouth and you made promises to God that if you do this for me, I'm going to do this for you. And God kept his end of the deal. That's why the word of God said over and over and over, be quiet. Mm -hmm. Don't be so quick to utter anything before God mm -hmm. and don't come back later and say, you know, I didn't mean it. I didn't, under I didn't understand. God said, I'm not trying to hear that. Mm -hmm. If you made a vow, you keep your promise. Mm -hmm. So now, for those of us who say we're saved, for those of us who say God lives in us, for those of us who say we're filled with the spirit, when you open your mouth and you make promises to God, do you honor your promise? Mm. Do you keep your promise? For those of us who are in trouble and we said, Lord, if you get me out of this, I promise I'm going to do this, that, and the other. Have you kept your promise? For those of you who say, if you get my son out of this, if you get my daughter out of this, if you get my husband and my wife to act right, if you get my kids, in, I'll do this. Have you kept your word? And I'm going to make it even a little more personal. And this is where all of you going to get convicted on some level. I don't care because we need it. <laughs> if God lives in you, mm -hmm. if you're saved, mm -hmm. if Christ abides in you, mm -hmm. what happened with Ananias and Sapphira? Jesus. Jesus. When Ananias and Sapphira lied, Jesus. Peter said, you didn't lie to me. You lied to the Holy Spirit. You lied to God. Yeah. And it cost them their life, both of them. Yep. But you would say, but they were talking to Peter, but the Holy Spirit resided in Peter. That's right. Yeah. So what am I saying? Mm. If the Holy Spirit resides in you, if you're saved and God lives in you, Speak. and you talk to your husband, your wife, your children, or anybody else that is saved, that is born again, and God resides in them, and you opened your mouth and made a promise to them, you made a promise to God. My God. So if you broke your word to them, uh -huh. you broke your word to God. Jesus. Yeah. Now, how about that? Hmm. My Lord. How many of us have promised somebody that we know are saved, we promised them something, and they held up their end of the deal, and we didn't hold up ours? Jesus. Wow. How many times? <laughs> you are accountable for the words that come out of your mouth. Do not Drew Hill. Y'all know I'm a music man. Here we go. <laughs> Drew Hill made a song 
Never make a promise that I can't keep. Y'all know I ain't going to sing it right now because I don't want y'all to start falling in love with me, even though falling in love is not biblical. You know See, what? you thought I slipped. No, no, I'm on top of mine. They made a song, never made a promise that I can't keep. And everybody was saying to the, all the women used to say, I wish y'all was like Drew here, but you didn't pay attention to what they said. Uh -huh. He said, I'll never make a promise that I can't keep. He didn't say he was going to make the promise. Mm -hmm. He said, if I make you one, it's because I know I can keep it. That's what the song is saying. That's what it said. So how many of you are in a relationship with somebody Jesus. you make promises to and you don't keep them? Mm. How many of you promise your children, clean up your room and I promise I'm going to give you some ice cream? <laughs> and this is just an example. And they clean their room and then you say, well, I ain't got no money right now. Jesus. You say, you don't need no ice cream right now. You need to eat your dinner. You don't honor your word to your child. So when your child grows up to be a habitual liar Jesus. and you're wondering why, it's my because Lord. they're following the example you set. My mm. Lord, my Lord. How many of you have asked God to forgive you? Because God promised if we turn our sins over to him, he's going to cleanse us. He's going to forgive us. He's going to throw it in the sea of forgetfulness. And we know that God's word said, if we don't forgive, we won't be forgiven. So how many of us have promised that if God forgive us, we're going to live our life worshiping and pleasing and serving him to the best of our abilities. But then you can't forgive somebody else. So you don't lie. You don't went back on the deal already. Mm -hmm. Because everything that we do from the point of accepting Christ in one way or another is a reflection of your character. And if your word ain't no good, you ain't no good. Ain't no good. In the streets, True. everybody got a different story. And some of you know some of mine. In the organizations that I dealt with, in that, in that life, we always said, your word is your bond and your bond is your life. If you break your word, your life means nothing. So whatever happened, happened. And we meant that because we had a principle. Don't say nothing you don't mean. Don't promise to do something you're not going to do. And if you say you're going to do it, do it. Mm -hmm. That's the same principle that God always lived by. Amen. God never made a promise to us that he didn't keep. But how many of us made promises to God that we had no intention to keep? And when we said it, we just wanted to get out the situation we were in. But because you spoke the word, uh -huh. because death and life is in the power of the tongue, uh -huh. and you spoke the word, uh -huh. God honored the word that you spoke, and he kept up his learning. He kept up his end. But you didn't. Oh. Yes, you, did. you didn't. The court tell you you got the right to remain silent. Yeah. Let me show you something. For those of you who have ever been in trouble with the law, yes, I'm going to teach you something about words. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they had this thing called Miranda rights. Miranda was a little white girl. Something happened to her. The family put up a big thing, so they made this right after her. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you. You have a right to an attorney. If you can't afford an attorney, the courts will appoint you one. Do you understand your rights? And you say yes. And then you start talking. They just told you to shut up, but you start talking. You, you give a statement. And you write a statement and you sign a statement. Now watch this. You have the right to remain silent. Anything, anything you say can and will be used against you. So you can sit there and tell the truth. They let you know, even when you tell the truth, they're going to find a way to use it against you. But you still talk. When you talk to the law, you go by the land of the law. Jesus went before the law and said nothing. Nothing. He didn't say a word. He understood anything he said would be used against him. And this was long before Miranda rights came into play. That's right. Jesus went before them and said nothing. And when he finally opened his mouth, he dropped the mic. Because when the man said I got the power to kill you or let you go. And you ain't talking to me. Jesus said, uh -oh. you have no power at all over me except to be given to you from on high. He dropped the mic right there. Because from that point on, Pilate was trying to figure out how can I let him go. 
Yes, it was. But now back to you. Get away from Jesus. Back to you. <laughs> How many times have your grandparents or somebody told you, just keep your mouth shut? Mm, oh. Yes. And you didn't. And you said when you got in trouble, oh, if I had to just listen. <laughs> How many times, parents, have you told your child, if you just tell me the truth, you won't get in trouble? Mm. And they told you the truth, and you got an extension cord and tried to beat the skin off of them because they took you at your word and you were a liar. That's true. I need you to think about this because I need us to start understanding God is holding us accountable for what we say out of our mouth. Yeah. And when you make a promise to God, you got to keep your promise. There's repercussions for liars. Again, let's go back to the street for a minute. If you vow to do something for us, you're one of us, your family, and you vowed to do something and you didn't do it, there were consequences for those actions. Oh, some people call it shoot the fade. Some, call it what you want to call it. Those hands going to fly because you made an oath to do something and you didn't uphold it. So it got to be repercussions. That's how we dealt with it on the street. How do you think God going to deal with somebody who calls himself a child of his and you didn't lie to nobody but him? You lied to God. God gave you what you asked for and you went back on your word. You're telling God, I don't honor and respect you. I don't have to keep my promise to you because in my eyes, you're a chump. That's you're telling God. Mm. What you going to do about it? That, that's what you say when you lie to somebody. That's true. Now, let's make this even a little more personal. Mm -hmm. When you're in a relationship and your spouse does or says something to you, that hurts you. And they come back and ask for forgiveness. And you say, watch this now. It's a lesson here. You say, I forgive you. The moment you say, I forgive you, that's what you're saying in the natural. Do you understand what you're saying in the spiritual? What you're saying in the spiritual is, I forgive you. We wipe it clean and I promise not to bring it up again. That's what I forgive you means in the spiritual. Amen. How do I know that? Because that's what God says to us. When we go before God and we ask for forgiveness, God says, I forgive you and I cast it behind my back. I remember it no more. That's, right. that's our example. So when you talk to your spouse who God said to become one and you do, they do something to you or they say something to you and say, I forgive you. You say it's behind us. I'm not going to bring it up no more. That means the next time you get mad, it shouldn't be coming out your mouth. That's what that means. It means 5, 10, 20 years from now, we still shouldn't be getting whipped with the garbage you went through way back then because you ain't got over it. Amen. That's what that means. God holds us to a standard. Yes, he does. We have to hold each other to the same standard. Amen. Now, forgiveness don't mean you got to be a fool a second time. That's right. I have forgiven a lot of people. That don't mean I'm still going to deal with them. Amen. And why don't I deal with them? Because I can only tell you about me. I don't deal with them because I know the first opportunity I get, I'm going to bring it up again. <laughs> and you might say that's not true forgiveness. <laughs> and I say nice. I have to accept that. I have to accept my own teaching. Mm -hmm. Because I know me. I told you before I got saved, I had a slick tongue. And I always want to be the last one to get in the last word. <laughs> that's what gets people in trouble. Amen. Always having to have the last word. Mm -hmm. That's why the word of God says, let your words be few. Amen. And what I have learned over these last, maybe this last year, a lot of people that I spent a lot of time talking to and conversing with, I asked myself, how is this adding on to my life? Amen. Because we have a lot of frivolous words going back and forth that don't mean nothing. They just sound good at the time. Mm -hmm. So I had to start cutting a lot of people off. Yep. Because you will never say, I broke my word to you. Mm -hmm. I pride myself. Mm -hmm. And I strive with everything within me. If I tell you I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it. Mm -hmm. If I can't do it, I'm going to let you know. Mm -hmm. 
If you right. tell God you're going to do something, if at the moment that you have to pay the piper, you can't, you better let God know, Father, I'm going to keep my word. This is what I'm going through right now. Please have mercy upon me. God will have mercy upon mercy and grace upon grace. Amen. The problem is when you make promises to God and you know you ain't got no intention on keeping them. And here's why it's a problem. Because God already know you don't intend on keeping it. But God keeps his promise to you anyway because he's going to hold you accountable. Yeah. God is not mocked. What a man sows, he shall also reap. And when I say man, I'm talking about you too, my sisters. Woman. You ain't off the hook. Because y'all make a lot of promises and y'all be lying too. <laughs> Woman. It goes both ways. God said, let your words be few. Do not be rash with your mouth. Think before you speak. And when you speak, know that there's death and life in the words that proceed out of your mouth. Amen. And when you make a promise to God, you better keep it. And any of my brothers and some of my sisters who may be watching this now or later that been in prison or been sitting in the holding tank mm. and you promise God, if you get me out of this one, don't let them give me 40 years. Lord, if you don't let them give me 40 years, I promise I'm going to go to church. I'm going to live right. I ain't going to cheat on my wife. I ain't going to do that. And you got convicted. My God. You feel like, oh, I ain't got to honor my promise no more. Mm. Uh-uh. What words came out your mouth? They gave you 20 years. Yeah. You said, God, if they don't give me 40 years. So he still kept the promise. Yeah. Yes, he did. You had to pay the price because you, you did what you did. Or even if you were accused, it don't matter. God honors his promise. You have to honor yours. Yeah. And it's not hard. You know how you can make sure you keep all the promises you make to God and man? Stop making them. You know you better than anybody else. If you know you're a liar, stop making promises. My God. You understand? Yes. If you know you can't be depended on, stop making promises. Mm -hmm. If you know you can't be trusted, stop making promises. And those of you who know people like that, stop talking to them. Amen. Tell me that I'm gonna tell you this and promise me you ain't gonna tell nobody else. Oh, I promise your secret safe with me. Nah. And the whole church know the choir singing the song about it. <laughs> People have to trust you. That's one of the reasons why when you come through the homiletics class, my young ministers, my young brothers and sisters, I tell you, we have a confidentiality clause Amen. in ministry Amen. the same way doctors and physicians have it in their field. Amen. If somebody tells you something in confidence, Amen. it cannot go anywhere. You have to keep that between you, them, and God. Amen. Because Amen. when you said, Lord, I accept this position, you said, I promise you can find me trustworthy. Amen. You can hold me to that standard. And when people come to you, they trust you yes, to be do. able to keep their mouth shut, especially when they tell you it ain't going nowhere. This is just between you and me. True. Amen. And when you open your mouth and it gets back to them because it's going to get out. Yes, it does. And you wonder why they stopped going to church. Mm. You wonder why somebody tried to commit suicide. You wonder why because you don't know how people are going to respond when you break trust. Mm -hmm. So if you know you're not trustworthy, stop pursuing ministry. Mm. Stop. Amen. Because people are going to trust you and take you at your word, and they're going to tell you some things that you don't even want to know. I know. That's the cost or part of the cost of being in ministry. You can't treat them any different. Amen. You can't look at them any different. You can't shun them and you can't tell their business. Amen. You said you wanted to be in ministry. Welcome to the real world. My God. But now I'm going to tell you something that's going to hurt your feelings. When God saved you, if God called you to ministry, if, if you accepted that call, Mm. Yes. then you promise God that no matter what I have to do, no matter where I have to go, no matter what I have to say, mm -hmm. according to your word, led by your spirit, I'm going to do it. Until God tell you to start saying some things that's going to start cutting down your family, your friends, mm -hmm. and then you find an excuse not to do it. It don't work that way. No, if you are in, if you're one of them people who care about what people right. think about you, get out of ministry. You have to be held accountable for everything that you say Amen. and everything that you do.
and there's no way around it. Now, I'm going to say this in closing. I told you at the end of last year that God was going to do in 2024, he was going to start exposing some things. Yes, he, he was going to start holding some people accountable. Yes. He was going to start bringing forth his word on another level. And God has done it. But I'm going to give a warning right now to everybody watching, everybody who may watch in the future. Listen to me. Let me take my glasses off. You understand me. In the spiritual realm, some heads are about to roll. Amen. The sword has been sharpened. Mm -hmm. It's being swung with two hands and some heads are about to roll. If you don't understand what I'm saying, you're in the wrong business. God is tired of liars and manipulators using his house as a house of merchandise. Jesus. God is tired of liars and manipulators that preach and teach what puts money in their pocket and don't care about the saving of souls. Mm -hmm. Some heads are about to roll. And if you still don't know what I'm talking about, just keep watching. Michael. That's all you got to do. Now, before I say walk in wisdom and growing grace, <laughs> when we started this lesson, I told y'all about my family and my friends, and I told y'all we were a family and we were a unit, and you got to see and meet and talk to everybody that was at the table Except I told you Apostle was not here because he was out taking care of business. Now, I need you to understand. This is my father. This is my pastor. This is my mentor. This is my friend. This is my confidant. This is someone that I trust. This is someone when I tell you I will lay my life down. I mean that in the literal and in the physical sense. I will lay my life down for this man. And I will take yours for messing with this man. Trust and believe I mean just that. Amen. Understand that. It's a time and a season for everything. And I will kill somebody behind this man. Don't mess with him and don't play with him because he's not a toy. Amen. I love this man. And I want y'all to see him face to face. I want him to say a few words to you. And then I'm going to get up off of here. This is my father, the esteemed and honorable Apostle David L. Mitchell Jr. of Word First Church. Amen. Amen. Keep it on Jesus on tonight. We want to thank you for the word that's come forth. We give you glory, honor, and praise. And I'll vow to you on tonight that what we say out of our mouth, own up to it. And be glad that God has given you another chance. Hallelujah. Allow the word to be truth, respectful, honorable unto you. That what we say, we mean what we say. And be blessed by the grace of God. Amen. 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 If you know what, wonder where I get it from? I get it from my daddy. <laughs> Walk in wisdom and growing grace. Until next time, God bless. <laughs>